Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's begin. So um, first, I want to make a correction. Um, as I was preparing my slides, it occurred to me that, to my horror, I made an error yesterday. And the error was this. So I was kind of rushed at the end, trying to, if, you know, we talked about the parity of the character that determines at which positive integers, aside from the number one, there's a, a, a simple formula for the value of the L function. And in a rush, I just, I knew you know, even characters, you have nice formula at even values, odd characters, you have nice formula at odd values. And I was just thinking about, you know, like the zeta function, it's a nice multiple of the power of pi. And so I said it was a rational multiple, and I illustrated with these two examples for the odd character chi 4, that's 1 at 1 mod 4 and minus 1 at, at 3 mod 4. And those numbers, that's absolutely correct. But the character, generally speaking, has for its L function values, not rational multiples, algebraic multiples. Okay? Rational numbers are algebraic numbers, but let me give you an example where the multiple multiplying factor is not just not simply a rational number, but it's at least algebraic. Okay? So th these still are correct, but in general, you have to allow more elaborate multipliers. So if we took the Legendre symbol for modulus 5, that's a character, mod 5. It's primitive, right? A character mod a prime can't come from a lower modulus unless it were trivial. So a non-trivial character mod a prime is automatically primitive. It's an even character because minus 1 is is a square, the character at minus one is one, and the Gauss sum of that character here is, uh, here it is, root square root of five, and so if you take the L function of this character at the number two, so you plug, plug in two for S, so it's the sum of the reciprocal squares with the coefficients go like the Legendre symbol values, one, minus one, minus one, one, zero, there's no five term, then one, minus one, minus one, one, zero, and so on, periodically, mod five, the value of this L function for this even primitive character is 4 pi squared over 25 root 5. It's an algebraic multiple of pi squared, not a rational multiple of pi squared. Okay? So I will um, place these slides in my notes right after the previous one. So five years from now, I'll think that that was part of the previous lecture. Although, actually, it'll be safe for posterity on YouTube. So I guess I won't do that. All right, so um, let's move on from those values. Um, actually, I want to make one more comment about that. Uh, I go on about primitive characters. What, what is, so a primitive character is a character, whatever modulus is, that can't be lifted, doesn't come from a character from a lower modulus um, by just reducing and applying a character to that lower modulus. Um, now, of course, you might ask, well, what was so special about a primitive character? It's the formulas... You know, I write, I use words, alge, okay? If you wanted to actually write out the multiplying factor, the primitivity comes into play to write down, the Gauss sums behave in a weird way for non-primitive characters. Yet, it is still true that, um, if your character is not primitive, the qualitative statement of being an algebraic multiple is still okay. What if chi is not primitive? Um, is L K chi, if K matches the parity of chi, that's right, so if chi is even, I want K to be even, and if chi is odd, I want K to be odd, so here K is greater than to one, is this value still an algebraic multiple of pi to the k? And the answer is yes. Okay? It's just not given by the formula in the primitive case. And the reason is that, see, if you had a character mod m and suppose, I mean, if you go to the lowest modulus of a character that it comes from, that's going to be a primitive character. So um, we'll call that modulus F. F is called the conductor. In Harris's um, talk today, he talked about the conductor of a character. The conductor of a Dirichlet character, it's the modulus of the primitive character that it comes from. So if your character is primitive, its conductor is its own modulus. Right? But if you had a character mod 8, 
that you can see, oh, well, it's periodic mod four. Well, then this conductor is actually four if it's non-trivial. But like the trivial character mod anything, this conductor is one. It's just the idea of the, the conductor. It's, it's basically like the minimal period of the sequence of values, but not necessarily. There's a little tricky thing there, but you should, intuitively, that's the idea. So, and, and we, the Germans developed a lot of algebra, so we use F because um, conductor, it's called the conductor, the leader, the Fuhrer. Sorry. Um, anyway, so, um, so if we take reduction, and if there were, let's say, chi prime was the primitive character where you reduce to that modulus and apply that, then, um, and chi comes from that, so this diagram commutes, then the point is that the L function of your original character is related to the L function of the primitive character. So this guy here is a primitive character. And they're just off by a finite number of Euler factors. One minus chi prime of P over P to the S. Okay? Essentially, you just kind of lop off the Euler factors in the L function of the primitive guy um, at the primes that go into M, and you're left with the L function of the lift of that character at modulus M. Um, so, sort of like the L function of the primitive character has as many Euler factors as it could, in some, some sense. Um, and the point is, you see, if you plug in an integer, if S equals K is a positive integer, well, then L K chi is this little finite product, one minus chi prime P over P to the K, L K chi prime, and hey, this additional business here is still algebraic. You got one minus some root of unity over a power over prime number. Okay, so the qualitative statement that is, we can say for all non-trivial Dirichlet characters, the values at the positive integers that match the parity of the character, they're all algebraic multiples of, of pi to the k. Okay, so you don't actually, the qualitative version is valid for all characters. Okay. Um, and maybe I was uh, criticized the notion of primitive character yesterday. Did I say it was a 19th century concept or something? What was I? Maybe I was just thinking that. No, I thought I said, if you go into the subject long, far enough, the notion of primitivity disappears as the notions get more and more abstract. Um, but uh, if you want to keep things kind of down to earth, this, this, this annoying, is it primitive, is it not primitive thing, kind of keeps cropping up. Um, all right. So uh, today, we want to, the, the main topic for today is you want to discuss the uh, analytic continuation of the zeta function and the uh, Dirichlet L functions. So I hope you're getting used to writing the letter zeta. It's a very useful skill in life. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go through the details, kind of like with the zeta function yesterday. I'll go through the details more with the Riemann zeta function because there's less notation involved. And then I'll sketch what happens in the general case, and I'll, I'll refer you to the notes. I'll post an updated version of the notes on the uh, program webpage later, later today. Okay. So how are we going to get the analytic continuation? So let me remind you... what the situation is for the zeta function. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply by pi to the minus s over 2, gamma of s over 2, zeta of s. We're only starting to the right of 1, where everything already makes sense. And I'm going to remind you, the gamma function is an integral transform <coughs> It's actually legitimate to the right of zero, but you know the zeta function itself only makes sense initially to the right of one, so that's where we're going to have to work. Um, so our goal is to get a formula for the completed zeta function, big Z of S, that actually makes sense everywhere. Certainly this initial definition is this product of three terms only makes sense to the right of one because the zeta piece only makes sense to the right of one. So we're going to have to do a little bit of analysis here uh, to figure out what to do. So <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to do is um, futz around with uh, pi to the minus s over 2, gamma of s over 2. 
So we got pi to the minus s over 2, and then we have an integral x to the s over 2. And I'm going to bring that on the inside, x over pi. And now I want to do a change of variables with x over pi. I'm going to set t to be x over pi. Now, I keep writing dx over x. The thing that makes dx over x really nice on the positive reals, it's multiplicatively invariant. If you replace x with a positive multiple of x, dx over x is unchanged. It's just like on the real line, dx is additively invariant. Right, d of x plus a constant is dx. And so here I'm just multiplying by 1 over pi. So dt over t is dx over x. And so what we get then is that this is equal to, and the bounds don't change, t to the s over 2, e to the minus pi t, dt over t. Okay? Um, so what are we going to, what are we going to do with that? Well, that's the first piece. And I'm going to multiply this into the zeta function and distribute it into every term of the sum. And I'm going to bring the 1 over n to the s inside the integral and do a further change of variables in each term. Okay. So let's keep that up there. We can see what's happening. Okay. And so then what we get is that the completed guy, pi to the minus s over 2, gamma of s over 2, times the zeta function. So I'm going to move the pi and gamma inside the sum and write it as the integral and bring the 1 over n to the s inside the integral. And let's see what's going to happen here. So I'm going to combine some terms. So I'm going to put the e to the minus pi t first. The t, if I want to have to the s over 2, um, what do I have to put in the denominator there? Last participation time. n squared, not n, n squared. Okay? Aha! So it's time for another, another change of variables. So I'm going to let... Uh, Let y be t over n squared. So every integral depends on n. For the nth term, I have the nth integral. So let y be t over n squared. So dy over y is dt over t. And so in the nth integral, I get e to the minus pi. t is n squared y. t over n squared is y. And dt over t is dy over y. Awesome. And so what can we do with this information? Well, now we're going to go back and uh, swap the order of summation and integration. And the only thing that depends on n is the exponential term. So I can take the y to the s over 2 out, and we're in good shape. Now, this is actually quite nice. You see, this thing here, the very first term, this kind of behaves like it, it, it converges very rapidly. And the very first term is e to the minus pi y. That's good. Okay? Um, and so I would like to uh, do something with this. I've kind of written, rewritten the completed zeta function, but this formula still has problems. Um, and so what I want to do is point out that this series is closely related to another series over all integers that has a very nice transformation rule when you replace y with 1 over y. Okay? So we're going to set theta, it's called a theta function, theta of y, sum over all integers, not just the positive integers, e to the minus pi n squared y. So if you combine the uh, n and minus n terms for non-zero n, you can see how it's related to the thing that we're actually wanting to do. It's 1 plus 2 times the thing that we care about. Um, and so it turns out, fact, so here y is positive. OK? 
Okay, not dealing with y equals zero or anything else, the series doesn't converge. So the fact is that theta of one over y is the square root of y theta of y. Okay, this is a very, very analytic statement. If you know about formal power series, you cannot think about this as some kind of formal algebraic identity in formal power series. Um, it's proved using the Poisson summation formula. In some sense, actually, this fact, so this fact should be regarded as the central step in our progress towards getting the analytic continuation of the zeta function. And um, to some extent, that can be reversed. If you grant the functional equation of the zeta function, you can sort of recover this equation that I just wrote down. So this nice transformation formula, this unusual transformation formula, if you've never seen anything like this before, is basically equivalent to the, uh, the result about the analytic functional equation, analytic transformation functional equation of the zeta function. So, um, so we're going to use this, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to break up that integral from zero to infinity. I'm going to write things in terms of uh, figure out how this formula turns into a transformation rule for this series, and then I'm going to break this into an integral from zero to one and one to infinity. And then I'm going to turn the integral from zero to one into an integral from one to infinity by turning y into one over y and using this transformation formula in terms of this function. The, the problem with this integral is the lower bound. If I were integrating this down to any positive number, like one for concreteness, this series would act, this integral would actually converge for all complex numbers. The problem is integrating all the way down to zero. I want to stay away from zero. So that's why I'm going to break it up to zero to one, one to infinity, and then the zero to one, I'm going to turn into an integral from one to infinity, and that change I can rewrite in terms of this with this transformation rule and get it. So as long as, as long as I can change the lower bound to a positive number, I'm in much, much better shape. I get an expression that is actually convergent for all complex numbers. So, um, so how's that going to work? So I want to give a name to this series. It's kind of half of the theta function, but it's not quite half. Notice the constant term. Okay, the one. This one, if you keep track of the math, this one here is going to be the source of the pole of the, zeta, of the completed guy at zero and one. This is going to cause the, uh, the pole to show up. Okay. So let's give a name to, uh, to that, that series. Let's call it uh, I don't know, H. So let H of Y be the sum over the positive integers. So it's uh, theta of Y minus one over two. And so you, uh, you can check that the, uh, this transformation rule implies and is essentially equivalent to um, this transformation rule. Or h, okay? So h of 1 over y is not quite root y, h of y. You have to add root y minus 1 over 2. So then the completed zeta function, uh, we saw before that it was the integral of uh, this funky series times y v s over 2 dy over y. And so now I'm going to do the kind of the integration step 0 to 1 plus 1 to infinity. And by writing down this integral from 1 to infinity, this guy right here, this guy converges for all complex numbers. Now remember the h of y business, it looks like e to the minus pi y. So it's an exponentially decaying thing. So even if s, no matter what complex number s is, that integral actually will converge. Um, and so I want to deal with this, this guy over here. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, I'm going to change y to 1 over y. <coughs> so that turns 0 into infinity, turns 1 into 1, h of 1 over y, y to the minus s over 2. And what the heck is d of 1 over y? That's minus 1 over y squared dy. So d of 1 over y over 1 over y, you multiply by y is minus dy over y. So we get a minus dy over y. And that's very nice because the minus sign will let us switch the order of integration. Plus the stuff above. 
And so now I get to switch the order of integration, h of 1 over y, y to the minus s over 2. And then I get h of y, y to the s over 2. So I'd like to combine the integrals, but, but this is h of y, this is h of 1 over y. And so I want to use this transformation formula to rewrite this in terms of h of y. Then I can combine the things. And this piece here, which from the algebra comes from that one, which comes from the constant term of the theta, this is going to be where the poles pop up. Okay. Are there any questions? Um, even more advanced methods of getting the analytic continuations by methods of what a taste thesis and so on, they, they, they still fundamentally rely on this, this clever idea of breaking up an integral and doing it, inverting the change, inverting the variable to keep your integration away from zero. Okay. So, um, so let's see. So what are we going to do with this? I'm going to uh, use my transformation formula. So h of y, h of 1 over y, is uh, root y minus 1 over 2 plus root y h of y. And then I'm going to integrate the whole thing. Okay, so I've just rewritten that. And so now, um, this is good to separate out. So, so far, recall, the real part of S is still bigger than 1. Okay, we haven't yet said, oh, everything makes sense now. Um, and so, you can check. If the real part of a number is bigger than zero, check the integral from one to infinity of one over y to the a, dy over y is uh, one over a. And so, see if I distribute this term into here, I'm gonna get y to the one half, y to the one half minus s has, y to the one minus s over two, dy over y, with the denominator of 2, and I get minus y to the minus s over 2 dy over y. So if I distribute this in, I can integrate them both because of this formula. And so what we would get then is uh, the first integral, there's a 1 half here, the first integral would become root y times that is y to the 1 minus s over 2, you're going to reciprocate it, you get 2 over s minus 1 minus y to the minus s over 2, minus 2 over s. So that's that first two integrals uh, from there and there. And then this and this can be combined. From 1 to infinity, I get h of y times y to the 1 minus s over 2, root y times that, and adding that y to the s over 2. Okay? This, isn't, this is really good. This converges for all complex numbers. And so now, we're in awesome shape, and so I'll put this term first, and I'll just swap the order of the terms. And you can see the visible symmetry under replacing s with one minus s. I'm gonna negate this and negate the denominator, and so you can see, aha! So this is analytic on C, analytic, except for, uh, Simple poles at 0 and 1. I guess I should say it converges. This integral makes immediate sense for all complex numbers, and you really can differentiate it. It's an analytic function, except for simple poles at 0 and 1, and the residues are at 0. The residue is minus 1. You might think at 1 the residue is minus 1, but it tricked you, because if you want to know the residue at 1, you want to look at 1 over s minus 1. You can negate that, negate that. The residue is a 1 there. In any case, um, and from the visible symmetry, z of s is z of 1 minus s. So the functional equation is not some abstract thing. We got a formula for the completed zeta function, and it's visibly unchanged when you replace s with 1 minus s. Okay. So, um, so what does that tell us now? Um, well, actually, yeah, so you can check, check that the old formula 
for zeta of 2k with k a positive integer is equivalent by the functional equation that we just wrote down in terms of the completed zeta function, it's equivalent to this formula. The zeta function at negative odd integers, 1 minus 2k, for k a positive integer, that's a negative odd integer, is that. This is rational. So you see the, the nasty transcendental values at the positive even integers turns into much more algebraic fact. The zeta function at negative odd integers is a rational number. What about the zeta function at negative even integers? Zero. That's also a rational number. Okay? And so for odd n greater than 3, zeta of 1 minus n, that's a negative even integer, minus 2 minus 4 minus 6, and so on. That's zero, and that's also minus bn over n. Remember the odd index for new numbers? Zero. Okay? So if we put these together, we have a kind of a clean universal formula for all n greater than 2. What happens at 1? At n equals 1, the uh, zeta function turns out to be negative. And minus b1 over 1. What was the first Bernoulli number? Minus a half by our convention from last time. Oops. Okay. So now you can see a reason why some people might prefer to set the first Bernoulli number to be plus a half. If you want that nice rule, minus bn over n, always to be the formula, then you do want to set the first Bernoulli number to be plus a half. So that's an example illustrating that fact. All right. So we see that the zeta function at the negative integers is a much nicer thing. So what is the story for the Dirichlet L functions? And we want to describe how you can complete it to get a completed L function and what the analytic continuation and functional equation look like. It should be something relating S and 1 minus S. Um, and then you know, what, are, what are the values, for instance, at the negative integers? Okay. Notice, again here, let me stress Zeta at positive odds are completely mysterious. At the negative integers, though, we know it everywhere. Okay, so the negative, the positive odds, with 1 minus s, turn into negative evens, and we just know that those values are zero. And some of the values, the fact that those are zero is sort of why, sort of related to the fact that the zeta at the odds are kind of mysterious. So if they weren't zero, you could solve for zeta of the positive odds. Okay? All right. Except for zeta of 1. Anyway. Um, so let's, let's do the story um, for the uh, Dirichlet L functions. Okay. Um, so we'll let chi mod m be a primitive, non-trivial character. Why am I avoiding um, primitive, non-trivial Dirichlet character? Why am I avoiding the uh, primitive trivial Dirichlet character? That would mean it would be just a 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 everywhere, and that L function for that is just the zeta function that we just talked about. Okay? Um, so, so here's the story. Um, how would you complete it? So the real part greater than 1 or real part greater than 0, because we know the L function series actually makes sense back to 0. Here's how I'm going to complete the L function. The completed L function, capital lambda, it's going to be two formulas depending on if pi is even or odd. Pi over m to the minus s over 2, gamma of s over 2, times the L function. If chi is even, the m, the m is the modulus. Pi over m to the minus s plus 1 over 2, gamma of s plus 1 over 2 ls chi if chi is odd. Okay. Um, again, we get different, different conventions if, if chi is even or odd. Um, the theorem would be that this function is actually an entire function. That this function 
analytic everywhere on C. No poles. Riemann zeta function, the completed zeta function rather, had poles at zero and one. The Riemann zeta function had poles at one. Um, this guy is an entire function and would imply that the L function is entire also. No poles, not even at one, no problems. Okay. And we have the uh, functional equation. The, the value at s, you think, oh, it should be the value at 1 minus s. Not quite. It can be related to the value 1 minus s for the conjugate character. So if your character is quadratic, taking values only 0 and 1 and minus 1, it's actually the same thing. But there might be a number out front. Um, and that factor we write as w of chi, which is called the root number. Doesn't mean it's a pure root of some famous number, but um, where this w of chi, it's a constant. It doesn't involve the number s. It's just a constant determined by chi, and it's the, the Gauss sum of chi over root m if chi is even, and it's the Gauss sum over i root m if chi is odd. Okay, so again, depending on the even or odd, you, you divide by i perhaps. So that's a constant of absolute value 1, I might point out. I mentioned last time, Gauss sums of primitive characters, their magnitude is the square root of m. Um, so it's some, some number of absolute value 1. And so essentially the value at s is related to value at 1 minus s, but you have to conjugate the character and toss in um, some number of absolute value 1. Okay? So if your character is quadratic, it turns out the root number is 1. And so you get the value at s and 1 minus s are equal, but you have, just like the Riemann zeta function, this chi equals chi bar, but in general, the root number might be some other thing. So the way you prove this is by mimicking the situation from before, you just have to find the replacement for that, that theta function. Okay, so let me tell Are there any questions? Questions? So what would be the replacement? How do you prove such a thing? Thank you. Is there, is there a good heuristic for why only for the trivial character it's got a pole at one but no others? Like, is there a good, like... Hold, hold your horses. We're about to see the analog of the theta function. I mentioned before the source of the pole is the constant term in the theta function. So you're jumping the gun. We're gonna, I'm about to write down the theta function, and then we'll come back and address exactly that issue. Okay? Um, so good timing on that. So we need an analog of what I, you know, I said that the, the, the zeta function leads to that uh, theta function summing over all integers. And so you could try... So the L function um, an analog of the theta function, a sum over the integers, and I'm gonna put chi of n in there. Okay? Now, what is the nth term when n is zero? Zero. It's not there. See this. Classical theta function n zero, so there's a one there. But for this guy, so if you combine the n equals zero term is actually zero because chi is non-trivial, so chi of zero is zero. And if you combine the n and minus n terms, the e to the minus pi n squared y is unchanged, and I can put chi of n plus chi of minus n. Now, if chi is even, no problem. If chi is even. Those are the same, and we're in good shape. Okay, it looks just like the theta function was 1 plus 2, sum over positive integers, e to the minus pi n squared y. And now we just have 2, sum chi of n, e to the minus pi n squared y. But what happens if chi is odd? Huh? 
zero. Okay, I don't think we're going to make progress using the number zero for our theta function. <laughs> this is a bad choice. This attempt to mimic the theta function by taking the coefficients of the L function and inserting them as the coefficients of the theta function leads to stupidity when chi is odd. The reason this is problematic, the source of the problem, is that what I put in here was not an even function of n. In fact, it was exactly an odd function of n, and so they canceled out. And so what we're going to do is modify this if chi were odd. So if chi were odd, I want to evenify the coefficients. And so I'll do a very simple thing. I'll just multiply by n minus pi n squared y. Okay, this is even, right? Because chi, if chi is odd, n is odd, an odd function of n is an odd function of itself. Anyway, that product at n and minus n are the same. And again, at zero, the value is zero. And otherwise, at n and minus n, the values are the same. And so what we get then is something that looks more, looks more interesting. And so um, it turns out that this is essentially what you need to do. And um, there's a relation between theta of 1 over y chi. And I'll say essentially there's some scaling factors you have to account for theta of y chi bar. Theta function I'm creating here depends on the character. And if you relate 1 over y to y using the Poisson summation formula, you get a relation to the theta thing at y associated to the conjugate character. And this turns out to be the, uh, the source of the, the functional equation. Okay, And so using this, you can, you can write this as a sum of, as an integral transform, break it up, do a change of variables, apply the relation connecting y to 1 over y, and you get an integral, and you don't, the constant term, yeah, there's no one, there's no constant term, so you get no pole. So that answers the question of why we don't find any poles here. Um, so in the, uh, in the case of the completed zeta function, it doesn't vanish to the right of one by the Euler product. And so by the functional equation, it doesn't vanish to the left of zero. And so we can ask about, you know, what about the zeros? <clears throat> so to the right of one, it's definitely... Definitely not zero. The pi thing doesn't vanish. The gamma thing doesn't vanish or blow up to the right of one. And uh, the L function by the Euler by the Euler product, it doesn't vanish either. And uh, and so also, you know, for the conjugate character, same reasoning doesn't vanish. But then, for the real part, less than zero, the uh, completed guy at chi is the uh, the root number times value 1 minus s in chi bar, and here, of course, the real part is greater than 1, and so this is not 0. Okay? And so, so the zeros of this guy are all between 0 and 1 in terms of their real part. That's strip. Now, if you, um, if you look at the poles, of the gamma piece. Remember it was gamma of s over 2 or 1 plus s over 2? Because that doesn't van because the total completed L function doesn't vanish in the negative half plane, but the gamma function is going to have these periodic poles. And that's going to force the L function to have periodic simple poles, I should say. And that's going to force the L function piece to have periodic simple zeros 
to counteract those poles to make this non-zero when the real part of S is less than zero. Periodically, the poles here are going to be four because that's not zero. That has a pole, simple pole. That has to have a simple zero. So what we get, we get simple zeros for the uh, complete for the ordinary L function at the negative even integers for chi even and the negative odd integers for chi odd. Okay? Um, all other zeros are uh, in the strip between zero and one. Okay, So these are the trivial zeros. They look just like the riemann zeta function. However, there's a slight extra hitch. Um, the, the, for a non-trivial even character, there's actually also a zero at zero. So let me, let me mention that. Point this out. For non-trivial, even primitive chi, um, we have that actually. Fun fact: the uh, completed L function does not vanish on the boundary of the critical strip. Not fun fact, hard fact. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So we actually consider the for the even case non-trivial. Um, remember, remember, zeta of zero is minus a half. So the, you know the analog doesn't work there at the trivial case. But uh, anyway, that's sort of parallel to the fact that there was a pole at one. Yeah. Anyway, um, and so we actually consider the trivial zeros of the L function of a primitive non-trivial even character to not just be minus 2 minus 4 minus 6, but 0 minus 2 minus 4 minus 6 and so on. Okay? And so the, the, uh, so the, the generalized Riemann hypothesis is a statement that all zeros of the completed L function of a, for non-trivial <coughs> primitive chi have the real part equal to a half. Okay, or the equivalent version is that the non-trivial zeros, the ones that we haven't seen yet, the non-trivial zeros of LS chi, in other words, <coughs> those with real part between zero and one, strictly, <coughs> have real part equal to a half. Okay. So that's the statement of the generalized Riemann hypothesis. So either it's a statement about the non-trivial zeros of the ordinary L function, or just a statement about all the zeros of the completed L function. Here's an open question, as far as I'm aware. Check that at least the number one half never vanished, it doesn't vanish there. We know, we know, it's known that the, the, the Riemann zeta function at one half is less than zero. Okay? And in any individual case, you could verify this. It's believed that the number one half is never actually, it's on the critical line. It is, has real part one half. Um, but, um, and as far as people have computed, they've never found it to vanish there. It's believed that it doesn't vanish, but we've never proved that a Dirichlet L function, as far as I'm aware, as I speak, that uh, the, it doesn't vanish at one half. So if you could do that, that would be good. Um, right. Anyway, yeah. So, so that's the situation with the Riemann zeta function. Now, what is it? Now that we have a functional equation, um, we can ask, what does that tell us about the value of the Dirichlet L function at negative integers? Okay. And so, using the functional equation, for the completed L function, we get and, and knowledge of the trivial zeros, we get. Um, that for positive integers n, the ordinary L function at 1 minus n and chi, remember what, what was the situation with zeta of 1 minus n? It was a nicer number than zeta of n because it was rational. Well, this one turns out to be not necessarily rational, but at least algebraic. Okay, sort of related to what I said at the start of today, that you have the algebraic multiple of pi. So you do the functional equation that the power of pi kind of sort of disappears, um, and so you're left with a, so there's a much more algebraic structure to the Dirichlet L function at the negative integers. 
you've ever heard about piatic numbers, you want to piatically create piatic zeta function or piatic Dirichlet L functions, you try to interpolate the piatically the values of these at the negative integers with their algebraic, so that it makes sense. You can't think of something like pi as a piatic number in any way. Um, anyway, so that's the functional equation reveals this much nicer behavior of the L functions there. Now, what about the uh, generalized Riemann hypothesis? I made a table of the uh, zeros. That is, oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. So, what's the stats? So this is this is. So here's here's a table showing you the values of the um, a couple the first three non-trivial zeros. So the Riemann zeta function. You know, write them in the form one half plus i t t positive. Remember, you know, we don't probably you know t is positive or negative. Doesn't the functional equation? You have s and one minus s chi to chi bar. In any case, if you want to verify GRH numerically up to some height, you might as well just work in the upper half of the uh, complex plane. In any case, here are the imaginary parts. They're all one half plus i t. So the first zeros, character to mod three, mod four, mod five. It's square and it's cubed. This character is the one I wrote before, it's chi five of two is i. Okay. Um, actually, the values are sort of trending down. Um, the second zeros, the third zeros, okay? And this, of course, these, this conjecture, GRH, has been verified beyond the third zero. Okay. There's been a lot of numerical evidence for it. Okay. Um, there is actually a precise theorem, kind of, in some sense, why the, the zeta function should have the highest, lowest zero. If you under, look at this table, you would understand what that phrase means. Okay? So uh, Stephen D. Miller had a paper, um, an IMRN. Anyway, you Google like Stephen Miller, lowest, highest, zeta zero. You can see it might have been conditional on some uh, other high conjecture that's believed. I, I, I don't exactly know the details. But anyway, kind of a curiosity. If you're gonna, you know, remember this imaginary part is around 14, but it's unusually high compared to the other initial zeros. So, um, right, so why do we care about the general Riemann hypothesis? So, um, so we just have a few minutes left here. So let me say consequences of GRH for all the Dirichlet L functions. So as I, I said, I think, in my first lecture, the significance of the Riemann hypothesis is really that it's merely a special instance of the generalized Riemann hypothesis most applications of GRH, you use it for infinitely many of these functions at a time. Okay, so maybe the most basic consequence is that an error in the prime number theorem in arithmetic progressions. So if a and m are relatively prime, and you count to the number of primes up to x that are congruent to a mod m. So if it was just primes up to x, it would behave like the integral of the logarithm reciprocated, but here I'm going to divide by phi of m. Okay, so the primes in each arithmetic progression mod m are kind of equally distributed among the options, the phi of m possibilities. So the gap between the count and this estimate grows no faster than some constant times root x log x. Okay, so it looks just like the consequence of the Riemann hypothesis. If m is 1 and a is 0, then you get the uh, prime counts error bound equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. So this is actually equivalent to GRH. Um, and so I guess we're running out of time here. So I'll just mention one more application, which is the following surprising results. Um, there's a constant K <coughs> such that for all M, and all proper subgroups of the invertible numbers mod m, there is a number below k log m squared that's outside h. In other words, if you have some mystery subgroup of the units mod m and you don't find an example of it below the k log m squared, your subgroup has to be the whole thing, all of the units mod m. So proper subgroups start missing numbers among the units mod m pretty early. Okay, In terms of Jeremy Teitelbaum's talk, this is like you know, 
polynomial time test to detect if the subgroup is everything or proper subgroup. See if all the numbers below k log n squared are actually in the subgroup. If they are, your, um, your, your subgroup is everything. So you don't actually have to check that far. Of course, the question is, what's k? You know, in, in number theory, often these, in, these constants we don't know. When we discover possible values, we turn out to go, 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 34. It's like, oh, can't use that. Okay? And so um, our lecture next time, so you know, next time, on our next episode of this course, um, we'll see how to use GRH um, to find a reasonable value of k. Okay? In fact, Eric Bach, in his PhD thesis in the early 80s, showed you could take k equal to 2. Very surprising. Okay? We're not going to quite get to 2, but you'll see how, by using contour <coughs> integration and residues, we'll, we'll figure out an actual value for that number k. Okay? And this is directly related to polynomial time primality tests and many other questions in number theory turn out to deci deciding when a, proper, when a subgroup is proper or not. Yeah. So,